Taking the leap and transitioning from a part-time side hustle or side business and going all in on your jewelry company can be stressful, exciting, or scare sighting, <laughs> however you wanna say it, right? But there's one thing for sure, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty in growing a business and sometimes you're not really sure where to start first. And on today's Ask Me Anything episode, we're gonna discuss this topic as I coach Marissa Hess of Oso Design Lab. She's gonna share with us a little bit about what she's been going through since her and her husband both quit their full-time jobs to go all in on their business. So before I dive in, I'm Tracy Matthews. I'm the Chief Visionary Officer of Flourish and Thrive Academy and the host of the Thrive by Design podcast. And I help jewelry designers and makers grow their sales to multiple six figures and beyond using our methodology called the Desire Brand Effect. And we do that through our courses, our coaching, and my best-selling book called The Desire Brand Effect, Stand Out in a Saturated Market with a Timeless Jewelry Brand. So Marissa came to me, she is a student in our Laying the Foundation program, uh, kind of a little bit nervous. She was scared to come on the episode, but she had a question and she was not sure how to handle this. You know, they committed to quitting their full-time jobs and going all in, they had some runway because they've been saving money for a while for this opportunity to grow their business. And she's like, how do you juggle it all? How do you do it and overcome this uncertainty of not knowing what's next? while staying focused on what you need to, to keep your business growing. And so the conversation was super interesting and I hope that this adds value to you and you get something out of it. So make sure that you watch the full episode. If you haven't done so yet, make sure that you subscribe to our channel, that you click that little notification button. And if you like this video, make sure you like the video and share with us one key takeaway at the end of it. So let's dive in to this Ask Me Anything episode with Marissa Hess. another Ask Me Anything episode to coach Marissa Hess. Marissa, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your jewelry brand and we'll start from there. All right. I make modern statement jewelry for heart-centered people with love, wood, and a laser. And it is a company that my husband and I started back right. in 2018. And it was kind of, you know, he bought a laser in the middle of the night and the next day, you know, when I woke up, he let me know that he had bought a laser and, <laughs> you know, I knew he'd been looking for years, but I wasn't expecting that. But anyway, he, um, he cut a snowflake for me in wood and I was absolutely hooked and it just, you know, it, it kind of coincided with when I was doing my yoga teacher training and like this whole new world of possibilities was opening up for me, ways of living and being that I just, I, I never knew about before. And it freed me to become the artist that I had always been, but had yeah. always denied that I was. So, um, so yeah, so that was three years ago, four years ago now. And he kept his full-time job until just this past January, at which time he came on full-time to be with me in the business. Awesome. And so, yeah, it's been, um, I've been selling on my website. I do a lot of pop-ups, but of course, uh, the pandemic kind of changed that. Mm -hmm. And so with the focus moving to online sales, that is a spot that I needed a lot of assistance with. I didn't understand how to grow that. Um, so now we're just, we're making it go full time. Awesome. That's exciting. Well, what's the name of your company so everyone can find you? <laughs> we are OSO Design Lab. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So Marissa, what is your question today? What can I help you with? <laughs> so Tracy, I want your guidance. I want to know what you would tell somebody who is moving from a side hustle where they have a choice to do the work or not to running a creative business full time, yeah. being the artist, and then also being the marketing and being everything else. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to do that. What kind of advice would you give somebody in my position? 
So what is the, the biggest concern right now? Are you freaking out because of sales or is it just juggling everything or is it all of it? It feels right now like juggling everything. Okay. I Yeah, it definitely feels like I'm just juggling everything and really unsure how to delegate and move things off of my plate. Like I want to be a leader, right? So mm -hmm. moving things off my plate so that I can be working on the business rather than in the business. This is such a great conversation. And do you feel like your sales are in a good enough place where you're feeling okay with that? No. Okay. <laughs> do you want to talk we, about that first? Um, yeah, we can talk about that. Um, I guess that what I would say about that is that we started the business with the intention always of pulling him out of the tech industry. And through a little bit of a windfall last year, you know, we were put in the f position financially to have a runway mm -hmm. that would free us from, from the paycheck. Yeah. And so we do have, we have a runway. We have, we'd have about 18 months to really make it grow and make it come into what it needs to be. But I also think that in order to support us and pay our bills, we need to be at about four times the sales that we have now. Okay. And what's your average price point? 20, $28. Okay. Awesome. So $28. So you're going to have to do volume in order to, how many units are you selling a month right now? Do you know? Ooh, Tracy, off the, off the top of my head, I do not know that information. Okay. Well, just, I wish I did. That's all right. So the best, okay. So first and foremost, when it comes to sales, like the easiest way to reach a sales goal is to reverse engineer what it's actually going to take to get there. So if you need to forex your sales, like in a reasonable time frame, what's it going to take to get there? And what are some other avenues that you could take to potentially get volume orders that could support the individual one-to-one? -one? Because a $28 average price point online is pretty low. And unless you're getting a ton of traffic to your website and a ton of volume with the orders, that it's just not a lot. So you might want to consider just some other ways to sell. So wholesale is always an opportunity. I think you guys have a really cool product and it's something that the right stores would actually buy a lot of because, it, you know, something that's, you know, $12 at wholesale or something like that isn't going to break the bank. And it would be something that they could, it could be like a fly off the shelf kind of thing. Right because right. your designs are really cool and they're light when you're getting them in the right stores. So right. I would start to consider like, what are some of the other sales channels that I can lean into to help increase volume of units? I mean, the thing with wholesale is like your $28 retail price point, you know, that gets cut in half when you're yes. selling to a store or whatever. But if you had someone who was ordering like hundred units at a time, that might make up for it, assuming that you have the capacity for it. The other thing that I want you to think about, if you were to forex your sales, can you guys handle the production on that? I don't think right now we could. So would you have to hire someone else? Possibly, yes. yes. And would you, would you be able to make that investment in the person based on your current margins and everything that's going on? I don't think that we could actually. Realistically, I don't think that we could. Okay, so this is something that I really want you to think about and not to freak you out with, oh shoot, like I don't have a business anymore, but how can you think strategically because you wanted me to help you work on your business instead of in your business and visionaries are problem solvers. So what would need to happen or what could you create from a more elevated standpoint that would increase the price point of your work that could get you where you need to be in a way that works? The right. first thing that comes to mind would be from a design perspective. Can you laser cut jewelry? Can you laser cut silver with your laser? No, we cannot. Okay. We cannot. There's so, other materials, but not metals. Wait, what'd you say? There are other materials, but no metals, no high-end materials, really. Cork, or is leather. this something like, does someone need to be manning the labor? Is it a human that has to man the laser like every, for every yes. single piece? Yes. Okay. So... There, you guys have to think strategically and through like, how can you create more efficiency in your production process so that it doesn't require a human to be standing there and so that you can get more volume out of the work. Maybe, maybe it's just raising your prices as they are right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something else completely. I don't know what your margin is, but 
there might be we, room for you to be able to increase the prices because it what like the earrings you're wearing right now that I see yes, it's yes. like a three tier. Yes. Earring. Yes. How much are you charging for those? Or these are thirty dollars. Because I feel like you could charge fifty dollars for those at retail. Really? Um, probably. So I I've, I've been working with your pricing module, and right now we are at um, two for retail, two two for or I'm sorry, two times two for wholesale times two two for retail. Yeah. Well, the cool thing that about things that don't have as expensive materials is there's probably room for a little bit more margin there. So okay. I don't know. You'd have to test it in the market right. to see. Right. And we did just push our prices. Um, and on some of them, I mean, there were, I had a couple of pieces that I ended up repricing at about a 30% increase. We're still talking going from 24 to $32. So there's still low price. Um, but we are currently doing wholesale, which is a market that I would love to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I do, I'm about to get on fair to grow okay, that cool. wholesale, awesome. which I know I've been looking a lot at the, at their margins and what their uh, commissions are. You um, have to add the commission on top of your pricing. Yes. Yes. I so, would add 15 to 18% over that for you? wholesale. I think, I still think you're a little bit underpriced. Okay. All right. So I, would take, I, I think, think that's that a heart. You, and maybe 48 at retail would be too high, but you have to test it. Cause I think that yeah. if you, people would pay like, to me, if I saw those in uh, somewhere, I mean, Urban Outfitters, I'd probably pay $32 for it. But if I saw it somewhere else, in a boutique in a more or something, type of store, right. $48 wouldn't even, I wouldn't even flinch over right. that price point. To right. me, like that's what the, all the polymer clay stuff is going for. Mm -hmm. I would look in the, and also this is laser, hand laser cut by a human. So like, I think part of what you need to be communicating is the labor that's involved. And so that's a big okay. problem that needs to get solved right there is, how do we elevate the perceived value of this item so that we can charge more? And how do we get more volume orders? And how do we handle capacity if we are going to get more sales? Because mm -hmm. wholesale is great. But if you're making, like, let's say you had a 12 unit minimum and your margin is $10 on a wholesale piece. So you're making $10 markup or $12 or $15, whatever. And you have a 12 unit minimum. What is that? If there's... If it's ten dollars, that's a hundred twenty dollars profit, or mm -hmm. like markup, right? Total. It's not that much it's not to order. A lot. So, right. like you, you have to work on that a little bit. Okay. And even though you've already raised your prices, you need to probably push it a little bit more okay. or increase the perceived value so that you can. Right. Maybe it's adding gems to it. Maybe it's adding more like precious, like silver or something like that. Um. So can we talk a little bit about that? Uh, Cause I do, there's like a mindset thing for me there. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to incorporate more stones into my, into my line. Um, mm -hmm. I know that, and I, I'm not talking like diamonds or anything like that, but um, you know, quartz and uh, selenite and uh, stones. Gosh, I don't even see, I don't even know about that. Gemstones. And yeah. Gemstones that, and I, I'm not confident enough. I don't, I feel like I don't really know about that world. And so it makes me it. feel intimidated to enter it. Just, just do it, it, she says, <laughs> just learn it. No one really knows about it until they learn it. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you're just gonna use like crystals, like you could just, there's a right here behind me, I have like the gemstone, I will show you. This is crystal Bible number three. There, These are just books you find. You can learn about crystals. Sorry, I probably right. faded out because I walked away from the mic around. But you could learn about crystals. There's a crystal Bibles. There, the gemstone dealers can educate you w about them. Um, and there's a lot of Googling that can happen for you to learn about gemstones. Yeah, You're not going to be using things that you need to go to GIA for and Correct. really learn about like refraction and all the stuff that is in like to tell if a stone is fake or real. Like that's not going to be important to you. You don't need training on this. You just need right. some research. Right. Okay. Don't worry about that. Get into but it. But I would actually serve it. you because you could increase the value. Like if you had a wood element and then like a crystal drop, even exactly. like a, um, uh, you know, those crystal points that you see everywhere, like a clear mm -hmm. crystal point would be super cool on a necklace or an earring. And it's, mm -hmm. um, would work with the vibe that you're doing. And if you're watching the video version of this, you can see Marissa's earrings on there. Um, and they're really super cool. But if you're listening to the audio, you can go stalker on Instagram. 
and find her <laughs> there and check out her jewelry. But there's, so I would consider like, what are the things that I could do to bump up the price point and start building my average order value? Because that's going to be a lot easier than trying to sell volume of $28 pieces. All right. And you can have the lower end pieces as a compliment, but you're really going to build the order by having things higher. And I, I really do believe that you need to increase, especially on the things without a gemstone, you're going to have to mark up probably 2.5 from, okay. or even three times your cost of goods All for right. wholesale plus commission. But once again, this is all something that has to be tested and you yeah, won't know until you get it on the market. So my friend Ray Perez's book, he talks about this case study from Tim Calkins from the Kellogg School of Management. I read that and I was like, I have to use the same case study for my book because it's so relevant to the industry. But basically this guy, he did three focus groups. One of them was, and they were all for this pair of 18 karat earrings. So the first group, he's like, this is from an independent designer, like someone who's just making the pieces, you know, and selling them. What would you pay for it? They said $571. And I might get the, a little bit off on the amount that people would pay. The second focus group, he brought them in. These are from Tiffany and Company. How much would you pay for it? $879 or $570, $870 something. You get the picture. The third group, these are from Walmart. They said $87. So do a focus group. Like, what would you like ask your friends? Like, you know, what would you pay for these? Or not, maybe not your friends. Ideally, people you don't know, but that are your target market. Right. And just ask and see what they're valued at. Or when you're walking down the street, sometime and someone says, oh, I like those earrings. And you start having a conversation about them and they're like, how much are they? And you're like, $48, see what they say. That is a big, I know the whole pricing thing. I, I was just going back over the pricing module and it definitely, it's a head game. Perceived yeah. value and charging what we're worth. Yeah, but I think if you were to incorporate some crystal gemstones or something like that, things that, and it could be just rough, the like rough points and stuff like that, I think could just that be is, cool. It doesn't have to be That is what I envisioned, sort of. Things, some, anything like super expensive quality, even there, like if, if that added like a couple bucks to your cost, it's not going to, it's going to elevate the value so much of the piece. Mm-hmm. Because it's a gemstone. Absolutely. Right. So that's the first thing is just really getting the average pr order price point up and increasing the prices of your work because I, I talked about this case study on the pricing and positioning workshop that I did a couple weeks ago and as we're recording this and the case study I used was Wendy Hively. She, when she first came to Flourish and Thrive years and years ago, probably eight years ago, she went through our pricing module for laying the foundation or we also had a, maybe it was mul multiplier profits because we had a pricing module for there too, um, which is a program we don't offer anymore. And she went through it and she followed the formula and increased her prices and her profits went up by 30% and her sales grew too because of that. But it, the sales number grew, but she didn't have to necessarily sell more. She just was making more money mm -hmm. and it didn't, the pricing increase did not affect her product at all. And I want you to look at her brand, Charlie Madison originals, because it's affordable and it's just gemstone bracelets with oil diffusers. She has a great desired sharing proposition. She's positioned really well and she knows exactly who her audience is, which is our military families. And building a side hustle, she has a six-figure business now. So I'm calling it a side business. It's a full time, it's a business, legitimate business, but she's making six figures a year. So if she can do it, anyone can do it because it's like what she's doing isn't I love Wendy and I'm, if Wendy's listening to this, this is not an insult, but what she's doing isn't a super original idea. It's just that she's positioned herself in a way that she can command a higher Absolutely. price point. And your work, you know, that laser cutting is all intricate. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I, you might consider too is are there things that you can do to get into additional categories? Like for instance, I got an, uh, Snowflake, you mentioned the snowflake earlier, and this reminded me of Christmas ornaments. Like, could you sell Christmas ornaments or leather, like a bag tags or things that you, other wood type of things where you could really approach a gifting audience? Are there places where you could get positioned or partner with something like Box Fox 
or Birchbox or one of these gifting box services where one of your items could be positioned inside of the box. So, and because of the price point, it would make sense because it's not super high. Right. So this is an option for you. It would be harder for someone with higher price point jewelry because they, they're trying to keep the gift boxes around like max $150. Right. Um, but we buy from Boxbox all the time for people and their gift boxes start at like 25 to 50 for like just the simple ones. So there, there are op opportunities there. And a lot of times those gifting companies they sell volume because they have done a lot of, they have a lot of investment in SEO and marketing and stuff like that. And they had investors in the beginning so they can, once you kind of get positioned out there and your products are part of their assortment, it could help. So I feel, I feel like we've kind of dialed in the product piece of this. I want to talk about some of the other stuff because you're overwhelmed okay. with all the things you have to do. <laughs> now, people have heard me say this. I'm not the one who came up with this word, but it's important to work on your business instead of in your business. And when you're first starting out, a lot of people spend most of their time doing just the making and not focusing on the marketing piece. And I don't think that that's you, but this comes from a book called The E-Myth Revisited. And it's a really important concept because people start businesses because they have a skill and they're good at it. Then they start growing their business and they realize, oh shoot, like now I've created a job for myself. This is not the reason why I started this business and it's painful. And so they end up growing their hiring a team and all this stuff. But then at a certain point, the expenses get to a place where they can't afford to keep the team. So they scale back and then they're back sort of where they were in the beginning, but just more exhausted and like frustrated. So it'd be really important for you right now. You're very early on in this full-time thing for you and your husband, who's your partner, to really think like, how can I turn this into something that's turnkey? And what I mean by that, it's not necessarily that you're gonna sell it or do anything like that, but more along the lines of like, how can I optimize the inside of my business in a way that allows us to move a lot faster? So I have a feeling there's probably a huge opportunity with the way you're producing the product, which we already spoke about earlier. I think with the marketing and sales aspect, like you need to probably get into a a better system, meaning that you're batching, con you're thinking through like, what are you gonna be marketing for the month and how you're gonna be doing all that work? Like, what are your key focuses? You have like um, goals or in traction, they call it rocks for every quarter that you're focused on and you're working towards a goal by the end of the quarter. Even if you don't hit it, you need to be focusing your energy on what you're trying to achieve instead of scattering your energy just willy nilly and trying to get a bunch of stuff done and then it's the end of the quarter and you're feeling frustrated. So I would get, start to get a little bit of focus on like what needs to happen for the next steps. And I know this is this is a lot. This is not like a 30 minute coaching call because it's like probably <laughs> a year full of full of consulting quite I frankly, think that's but probably true. Um <laughs> uh, or or working in a coaching program or something like that. But it's really about setting the structure up from where you are now so that when people come in they're easy to hire so that you could outsource parts of the business potentially and all these other things because also as i'm just going to skip back to this production piece perhaps there's an opportunity for you guys to start find a manufacturer who could laser cut the production part of it so it's not that you get out of the initial like the fun part of the designing it's just like right. once you kind of have it dialed and you're getting orders someone else can do the labor of it so that's something that you might want to think about. And it's a smart move. A lot of people okay. don't want to do it, but it's a smart move because it opens up your capacity so much higher. And, well, and that's interesting too, because I think that because we have the laser in our workshop, that's just assumed that that's work that we'll do. Like when I think it's- that's, that's like the easiest at, thing to outsource of anything. Yeah, yeah. Because like, you know, I think about outsourcing social media or outsourcing more like marketing, but I, it hasn't even occurred to me or to us to outsource that side. But you're absolutely right because it does require somebody standing at the laser. Somebody yeah. Has what to be on what it. about someone else standing at the laser and you guys just designing it? Right, right. And you could also hire someone to do it for you. But I personally think it would be better to find someone who can manufacture it for you. And, and I know that there are places out there because I've, mm -hmm. in, even in my business group, there's a ton of 
we get a bunch of swag of wood products. And so I doubt that the person in that business group, because it was a requirement, you have to have a seven-figure company at a minimum to even get in. And these guys are doing volume. So I doubt that there's one person just sitting there standing by the laser, the laser. cutting it. Like I know 100%. that there's options out there. Absolutely. The other thing I would do is really get clear on the responsibilities between you and your husband. Who is the visionary and driving the ideas? And then who is the operator or the integrator as they call it rocket fuel? And maybe that's him, maybe it's neither of you, I don't know. And clarify what you are doing in the business by role. So I think the more clear cut your responsibilities are, it's going to be a mm -hmm. lot easier to focus on those responsibilities. And I would make the marketing a priority. You know, I've been reading a lot on Instagram right now that a lot of these Instagram coaches are saying that two reels a day and one, like a, a couple of static posts a week and other types of content. And there are some people out there who are doing such awesome things with reels to get the word out there. And I feel like you have a huge opportunity with that I haven't, I'm not looking at your Instagram right now, but you have a huge opportunity with that because I think that the kind of stuff you do, especially if you create, like show the process and stuff like that, could go viral really quickly. And because the price point's so low, that results in sales. It's a little bit different. I mean, it's like $50 to someone isn't a big deal, but $5,000 for, you know, a ring like I make is a much bigger deal. Commitment. So. Or like even $200 is a much bigger deal for people. So like you have an opportunity now, the window's gonna shut pretty soon. So I would lean into some of those things from your marketing that would potentially create a big impact for growth. I can do um, that. I ride this line about Instagram and social media that is on one hand, I'm grateful for the amazing free platform that they give us. And on the other hand, I don't wanna do it every day. You have to. <laughs> I have to, yeah. But the other yeah. thing is, is you don't have to do it all every day. You could batch it and then have it ready just and post it. Right, absolutely. You could do it one day a week, have it all ready and post it. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be in real time. And this is this where is people get hung up because they're, I mean, even myself, like we're behind right now on social media and I'm every day I'm like, shoot, I need to post a reel today. So okay, Tracy, what reel are you going to do? And what's the idea? What do you guys, you know, what's the focus of the business right now? Yeah, it's funny for to me because like I teach this stuff and it's still easy to get behind, you know, sometimes. And so like the more that you can, but if you're really good at being disciplined, it's not that hard. And the reason we're like this is because I'm training a new director of marketing and uh, she's fantastic, but I have to teach her the like how I need to be served the content plan to get in advance and she's still in the phases of like building out the plan. So it's like, that's part of the reason why that's happening for me. So if you can create that structure for yourself, then it's gonna change a lot in right, the future, right. if that makes sense. It, no, it totally does. What I've been kind of working on with my husband is trying to bring him in. You know, I've been doing the business for my, by myself for four years. So the systems that I had in place, although they certainly weren't the best systems, it was the way that I was doing things. And so now I've got somebody coming in who I have to show him, share with him how I've been doing things. And of course- Is it documented? No. That's no. why. So that we're building documentation. Yeah, yeah. That's one of our things that we're doing. But it has, um, it's been sticky. It's been sticky yeah. for sure, trying to get myself out of my own way. And well, to understand that he's it's there It's a common, in. common <laughs> so, phenomenon. Um, I am yes, the worst yes. bottleneck in my business. <laughs> the visionary always is. It's the truth. But it's not just me. <laughs> no, the visionary is always the biggest bottleneck. You know why? Because they're most passionate and they care the most. And it's usually their idea that mm -hmm. kind of brought the thing mm -hmm. to life. And they like to meddle. So yes. we have a rule. Tracy's no longer allowed to lead meetings. And I am super grateful for it. I shouldn't be <laughs> leading meetings. And I've been telling people on my team this for a long time, but they're like, you own the company. And I'm like, I shouldn't be leading meetings because it's destructive. And mm -hmm. I'm sure there are visionaries out there who are great at leading meetings. Do I think most of them like it? No, I doubt it. And um, they're not fun. And so in the beginning, you have to do it. But at, like as your business grows, these are things that the creative type slash visionary type slash idea person should be removed from 
they should be a contributor and a collaborator instead of the leader of that. Because Absolutely. leadership is really about really more about inspiration and showing the direction, not managing. They're two different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have just a, a funny story about being our own bottleneck and about what we hear as opposed to what people are actually saying to us. Mm -hmm. So I make these ornaments. We make these ornaments. And a couple of years ago, my husband said to me, we do. Yeah, I do okay. make ornaments. Yeah. <laughs> um, my husband was saying to me, you know, I'll make a jig for you so that you can make them faster. So I don't know if everybody's familiar with what a jig is, but yeah. you know, it's something that makes our work production more repeatable. Mm -hmm. But when he would say the word jig to me, I would get so triggered and I would think he, he thinks I'm not doing it perfect. He thinks the product isn't good enough. He thinks all these things. That's what I was hearing as opposed to That's really he wanted, no, that wasn't it at all. He wants to help speed up production. He wants to make this more repeatable. So again, they're standing in my own way Yep. and thinking that it's some kind of reflection on my creative process, which it absolutely is not. <laughs> it is not. No. Um, okay. Awesome. So I feel like we covered a lot here in yes. about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been 30 minutes? Wow. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> but wait, I have so many more questions. Maybe I'll have you back on. I just, I want to get really clear because I know that you're really coming in here and you need to forex your sales in order to like really make the business work for you. I think the first place to start, in my opinion, is to take a look at your costing structure and dig deep into the numbers because the numbers don't lie and they give you a lot of information. What needs to shift and how can we get our average price point up from a direct-to-consumer perspective and how can we get our average price point up from a retail perspective. And it might mean that your wholesale order, excuse me, a wholesale perspective, it might mean that when you're selling wholesale, you have a higher minimum of like 24 units. And it might also mean that at retail, you consider how you can bundle things together or increase that retail price point so that you're, for each sale, you're making more money. That's my first thing to you. The second thing is, really taking a look at your production process, which is what we what you just covered, and how can you speed it up and optimize that? Because if someone is required to stand there with a the laser and it's super labor intensive, then maybe the labor intensive work should be outsourced to a production facility that has it dialed in a little bit more where you can buy pieces for, you know, per unit. And it, it might in the short term just cost you a little bit more, but it's gonna speed up what you can do and you guys can focus on the things that are actually going to move the needle more in your business then the next thing i would say is to get really clear on what your roles you and your husband are and reverse engineer like what needs to happen in order for that forex to happen by developing quarterly plans to support your financial goal so if you were to reverse engineer it and create a sales projection how many wholesale accounts do you need to get how many direct to consumer sales and at least like, even if you don't hit it, at least you know, and then you can have something like, okay, we're making some progress, but like, here's where we need to be for the next avenue. Mm -hmm. And then I would just, you know, you know, my thing, like just do the mindset work to keep yourself focused and start documenting what you're doing and your way of doing things. Cause it's going to help as you start to grow and want to hire people to bring more on or be able to bring people on and get things out of your head because it's not really a system if it's just your way of doing things that's in your head it it needs to be documented yes yes no i don't think it's and a we system. all know that way too well yeah yeah okay it's just the way i do things yep awesome so. <laughs> all right um thank you so much marissa for being on the show today you. you are awesome thank you you're awesome thank <laughs> you for this program and for the guidance i mean i think if anything, well. if anything if anything um, what LTF has really done for me is build confidence. I so, love hearing that. Yeah. Because well, I'd love to have you on another, another time to talk a little bit more about your experience in laying the foundation. I would love that. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much for watching the show today. And I am honored to be here. If you haven't done so yet, make sure that you pick up my best-selling book, The Desire Brand Effect, Stand Out in a Saturated Market with a Timeless Jewelry Brand. You can buy it on Amazon or head on over to desirebrandeffect.com today and pick it up right over there.